Hello all, welcome to our seminar series. I'd like to welcome Dr. Rosha Paudyal to our seminar series today. Dr. Paudyal earned her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology and pursued postdoctoral research where she employed single cell molecule techniques to unravel cancer epigenetics and study chromatin biology. At 10X Genomics, she previously worked as a field application scientist and provided support to a wide user base in academia and industry. She's currently one of the Global Science and Technology Advisors at 10X Genomics and is responsible for providing scientific guidance on adapting and utilizing 10X solutions in research areas. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paudyal for her talk entitled, Envision New Dimensions, Spatial Mapping in, of the Whole Transcriptome in the Tissue Context. Welcome. Thank you, Jessica, for the very nice introduction. Thank you to everyone who's here today to listen to me talk a little bit about our Visium Spatial Gene Expression Solution from 10X Genomics. Um, we are very happy to be here today and provide you with a brief overview of what the solution is, how people are using it, and if you wanted to use the solution for your own research, how you can get started. So when I think about 10X genomic solutions, usually they're currently two different platforms we can think about. First is the single cell platform, which some of you might be familiar with. We have a, this tiny toaster size instrument that people like to call it, it looks like a toaster, which runs most of our single cell assays or all of our single cell assays. And then we have the Visium platform or the spatial transcriptomics platform. For this particular platform, so we'll start off with the broad question of why is spatial biology important? followed by what kind of questions people are answering using this technology. And then lastly, we'll end with how you can get started on this technology as well. And before moving too forward uh, with the technology itself, what I do want to say is currently the Visium solution as is supports fresh frozen tissue, but we are launching FFPE support. So I'll give you a brief overview of what the similarities and differences are between the fresh frozen and FFP biochemistry, as well as just one quick slide on something exciting that's coming up with Visium as well. So I usually like to show this slide, which we call our 10x uh, innovation engine slide. And that's primarily because we started as a company that provided solutions for doing um, whole exome and genome work with single cell RNA sequencing in 2016, which is pretty much very highly adopted at this point. But the innovation, we listen to what the research needs are, and we're constantly evolving our products, either bettering the products that we already offer or coming up with new solutions that is useful to researchers to answer very interesting questions in biology. And not only have we the chromium controller, which runs all of our single cell instruments, but we've also tried to delve into something like the Chromium Connect, which is an automated way of doing your workflow. So you would just put in your sample and you get all your final sequencing library out. So you're taking out all the manual aspect of doing the workflow, as well as now we have our Visium platform, which goes into spatial transcriptomics. And I won't be talking about this today, but we, we are heavily invested in the spatial transcriptomics field because we also have applications coming out soon for in situ as well. So starting with the question of why is spatial analysis important? And the quick and easy two word answer is because location matters. I like to use this example because I think it makes it very apparent for why spatial biology is important and what it can tell you. So on the left, we have an example of what we call a hot tumor. In pink are all the tumor cells, and then in green, you have the immune cells. So if you look at this picture, you can easily see, oh, there is a tumor, but there are these lymphocytes that are infiltrating the tumor. If you look at the tumor on the right, this is something we'd call a cold tumor. The immune cells are kind of stopped at the boundary of the tumor, and there is no lymphocytes that are infiltrating the tumor. So if someone saw this picture and said, oh, if I have to talk about the prognosis or maybe a response to a particular therapy, they would say, oh, the hot tumor has a higher likelihood of maybe responding to a therapy because based on the lymphocytes that are infiltrating, we can make that kind of a judgment. So going back to pre-single cell time, if you just took these two samples, ground it up and did a bulk RNA sequencing experiment, for example, the 
data that you get from there is not going to be very conclusive. You might be able to say, oh, there are some differences, but we really don't know what's causing that difference. So there is also the option to do single cell analysis with these. So you could take these cells, uh, generate single cell suspension. So while you might see there's differences in the stromal compartment and immune compartment, it's, it's still a little bit tricky to figure out. You can generate a hypothesis, but when you see a picture like this, which makes it very clear why you might be seeing the differences in what you see with the immune cells or the um, cancer cells, then it's very easy to come up with a reasoning or a hypothesis and say, hey, this is happening because of X, Y, Z. So what the Visium solution really does is it combines two types of information into one. So you have your imaging information with either histology or immunofluorescence, whichever you decide to do. And then you have your unbiased whole gene transcriptome. And Visium really is a combination of this histology and gene expression. So we're combining pathology with genomics. And spatial biology, even a few years ago, when we first acquired the spatial transcriptomics co company, and which is now the Visium product, even during that time when we were talking to researchers, what is going to be the next need in this um, in the research field so we can answer questions that we not we have not been able to answer before? And the resounding answer was spatially resolved transcriptomics. And in 2020, Nature Methods also picked spatially resolved transcriptomics as their method of the year. And even in just the last year and a half that this product has been commercially available, it's been started to utilize pretty, pr pretty rapidly. So we're seeing not only preprints, but a lot of uh, peer reviewed publications that have come out that utilize this technology. So with that, now I'd like to walk you through a few examples of how this technology has been used to answer questions in neuroscience, oncology, immuno-oncology, and immunology. So this is one of my favorite papers, and this was also the first uh, publication that uh, came out as a pre-publication once the Visium solution had launched. So I like going to this paper because it really does a lot of benchmarking experiments to show that the data you get from Visium is comparable, as well as you can get a lot more data with Visium compared to something like in situ analysis that is pretty standard currently. So this publication comes from the Lieber Institute at Johns Hopkins University. And the researchers here were looking at the human dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a pretty well-studied region of the brain. And it's also been associated with a certain uh, few uh, brain disorders, such as schizophrenia, as well as autism spectrum disorder. I think studying the brain is a fantastic idea as well because it has these nice structures that you can go in and look for. So there is a spatial organization on this part of the brain. So when you section it this way and look at this particular region of the brain, there's actually different layers that you can see. So it goes from layer one all the way through layer six, which means there are particular genes or markers that you can look for in these particular layers and then go into the white matter. So the two things that the researchers try to do here is first and foremost just see how Visium compares to a lot of the data that's available in situ data from the Allen Brain Institute, followed by because Visium is an unbiased whole transcriptome approach, what other new novel genes or markers you could find for uh, not just these different brain regions, but also in schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder. So the panel on the left shows the Visium layer, the different layers, layers one through six in that particular region of the brain from Visium data. And you can really nicely see how there's distinct coloring that goes from layer one all the way through layer six, and you have this white matter here. So this is looking at the overall um, gene expression pattern that you see. And now you can start going in and look at particular genes. So for example, PCP4 is enriched in layer five. And this panel here shows the in situ data from the Allen Brain Institute. And you can also see that there's quite a, a bit of expression of PCP4 in layer five of this particular region of the brain. 
And like I said, because this is an unbiased approach, now you can start going in and looking at different genes and different layers and see if there are other new markers that you can, you can find. So for example, the TRABD2A gene is enriched in layer five, which you can see here. Similarly, they found the gene KRT17 to be enriched in layer six. And all of this uh, data was also validated with in situ, which I'm not showing here. Um, so this was a really nice paper that shows that current solutions or gold standard that we have, the Xeom data does recapitulate what you see, but there's a lot more uh, richness in the Visium data that you can dig in and find a lot new information with. This example comes from Paul Cavari's lab at Stanford, and this is more of a multimodal experiment where Visium is a, a big part of it. So what they were trying to do is they're here they're studying um, cutaneous single cell carcinoma, which is actually a pretty common malignancy in the US. So here they're looking at um, they perform visium on fresh frozen tissue, as well as they do histology and immunohistochemistry. With FFP, there's something called multiplexed ion beam imaging that you can do for protein work. And they combine all of this data together to come up with a comprehensive understanding of what's happening in normal tissue versus the tumorous tissue. So what they do is for the sample itself, they actually get a section that's normal from the patient as well as part of the tumor and perform all these different experiments. So when we look at just the single cell data from uh, the tumor versus the normal skin, we're particularly they're particularly looking at uh, here at keratinocytes. So there are certain genes that are shared between the normal and tumor, and that's what's shown on the left panel here. So these are all genes that show up similarly between normal and tumor, versus if you go to the right panel, there are some tumor-specific genes. So in the normal keratinocytes, you see these three or four different clusters, versus when you look at the tumorous region, there's actually a new cluster that you don't see in the normal tissue. And these are the tumor-specific keratinocytes, the ones shown in green here. So when they take this uh, single cell gene expression data and we know the identification of these tumor keratinocytes, and now you can layer that onto Visium as well, what they found is when you look at where these tumor specific keratinocytes are, they're actually usually located on the leading edge of the tumor. And part of the hypothesis that's driven from this experiment is when you excise the tumor, it's curative, but some of the patients can have a recurrence and a metasta metastatic disease, which they succumb to. So the hypothesis now is that these tumor-specific keratinocytes are on the leading edge of the tumor and they have access to the blood vessels and they also interact with cancer-associated fibroblasts. So possibly they're using the blood vessel and this interaction helps them get into the blood vessel and um, result in a metastatic disease. This example from, is from the earlier version of the Visium solutions, but so spatial transcriptomics, but I really like this example because it shows what can be done with this technology. So the goal really here for this particular experiment was to look at what kind of immune cells and how the depth of this immune cells infiltration was in these HER2 positive breast tumors. So they're looking at HER2 positive breast tumors and they're doing serial sectioning and performing visium on, or spatial transcriptomics on each of these section so they can come up with this volumetric or 3D reconstruction to see how much the immune cells are uh, penetrating the tumor. On the left is the pathologist annotated H&E section. So you can see they've annotated um, DCIS in orange, a particular of interest. What I'll be talking about is the immune cells in yellow. So, and in the middle panel is the spatial transcriptomics data. So it's like looking at a heat map. So the more red it is, the more immune cells are present. So it has a higher immune score. And this is just overall, all immune cells in general. So when we look at how it correlates to the pathologist annotation, it looks pretty good. So most of what's showing up as a high immune score here is also what the pathologist annotated. 
But because with the spatial transcriptomics data, now you can start looking in at different types of cells, you can start digging in further into different classes of the immune cells. So instead of just saying immune cells, what if you said, I want to look at memory B cells? So when you dig in and look at memory B cells, this also correlates really nicely with what the pathologist showed. But when you look at something like T helper two cells, whatever the pathologist annotation for immune cells said, these cells are actually outside of that region and a little more diffuse. So the goal really here shows that there are certain things you can see from the pathology aspect, but a lot of times there's, because if you're looking for just all of immune cells, you can't really see that with the pathology information, which you can see with spatial transcriptomics. And then a lot of times there are also molecular changes that precede phenotypic changes. So with spatial transcriptomics, you have the ability to look at different genes and you have certain markers that you know um, are indicated in this disease that can further down show up as, in a, as a phenotype, then you can start tracking these as well. And then again, because they did these serial sections, now they're able to compile these together to come up with a volumetric reconstruction. So for example, here they're showing there's heterogeneity within tumors and different slices you're looking at. And you can go in and look for a particular type of cells that you're interested in. So for example, here, this uh, reconstruction is for the CD, it's positive T cells uh, expression signature. And recall I said that these are all HER2 positive patients, but when you look at the tumor differences between one patient to another, there's a lot of heterogeneity with regards to how much the immune cells are infiltrating. So you can see differences between um, tumor A going all the way through tumor D. And something like this, again, can be used as a prognostic marker or used as a method to determine which kind of therapy regimen would work for this particular patient or not. And then lastly, one more example that I'd like to show before we dive into the workflow details. This is in the area of immunology. So the researchers here were interested in profiling the immune infiltrate that happens during chronic inflammation. And the two um, inflammatory diseases they were looking at is rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is usually primarily affects the peripheral joints. So you have your uh, small joints of the hands and the feet feet that bother you a lot with inflammation, whereas spondyloarthritis usually tend to affect the spine, and it has little to no effect on the peripheral joints. So even if there are chronic inflammatory diseases, they possibly have different pathways that, that um, manifest in these diseases. So the current understanding of these two particular diseases, it's largely based off of studies of synovial fluid that's been extracted or synovial biopsy material. And a lot of times like transcriptomic profiling of these biopsy material is usually focused on cells that come from homogenized tissue. So what they wanted to do here is they looked, they used spatial transcriptomics and they wanted to focus on specific regions of the tissue, especially where you have these infiltrating leukocytes and see what kinds of um, infiltrate differences you can see between the two disease type. And long story short, so if you look at the heat map on the right here, uh, primarily most of what's on the left side of the heat map is rheumatoid arthritis. On the right side of the heat map is spondyloarthritis. So there are definitely clear distinct gene expression signatures that are different between these two diseases. And what they found was when you look at the gene signature for rheumatoid arthritis, it had a lot of adaptive immune response profile versus for spondyloarthritis. It, the genes that were in, uh, implicated were tissue repair function genes. And not only that, but because you have the tissue morphology as well, you can now start going in and looking at the uh, regions where you see these infiltrates as well. So with that, I'll move now into the Visium workflow. Um, as I mentioned, the first part of the workflow, I'll focus on our fresh frozen solution, which is currently available. And then we'll transition into the FFP solution and we'll talk about how the chemistry of the fresh frozen and the FFP solution differ from one another and what that means for the bench work and the workflow as well. So, if we think about this experiment as a very overall, the forest view instead of the tree view, there are essentially three different um, 
sections or three different parts that uh, I think about when we think about the Visium experiment. So the first part is sample prep. So this, of course, involves your um, freezing of your tissue or embedding your tissue uh, for FFP preservation and sectioning it and putting it on a slide. The second part is imaging. So HE staining and immunofluorescence are compatible with both fresh frozen and FFPE. You do have to pick one or the other. You can't do both on the same tissue section, but you can do HE on one uh, section of the uh, tissue and then eight, uh, immunofluorescence on a different section of the tissue as two separate experiments. So imaging is another aspect. And then the third aspect is, of course, barcoding and generating these uh, sequencing libraries. In terms of data processing and data visualization, like with all of our other solutions, we do provide software that does the data processing as well as our loop browser that helps you visualize your data. In terms of how we've enabled whole transcriptome analysis with the Visium solution is we have what we call our gene expression slides. So if you look at the gene expression slides, there are these capture areas. There are four capture areas in a gene expression slide. Each of them is about six and a half millimeters by six and a half millimeters. So within the six and a half and six and a half millimeter area, there are about 5,000 barcoded spots. So if you zoomed further in and looked at what these barcoded spots are like, for example, if we zoom in between the blue and the green spot here, and if you looked at particularly just the green spot, there's going to be a lot of oligos on here that have a particular um, structure of oligonucleotides. So you have partial read one, which we use as a PCR handle as well as for sequencing an Illumina library, followed by what's important here is the spatial barcode. So this spatial barcode is essentially a coordinate that we know where it should be on this capture area, followed by a 12 uh, nucleotide unique molecular identifiers so we can remove PCR artifacts and PCR duplicates. And we're priming off of the poly A tail of mRNA species. So we have this poly DT. The spot itself is about 55 microns in size and the distance, the center to center distance between two spots is about 100 microns. If you go back to the image of this capture area, you'll notice on the four different corners, there are these different shapes, what we call a fudicial. So when you section your tissue and you put it on this capture area and take an image, it's that you're generating your cDNA on the same um, capture area on this gene expression slide. But what happens down the line is based on these fudicials, you can then align your image of your tissue and because we know what the spatial barcodes of these molecules that we generate from this uh, gene expression slide is, now you can overlay the gene expression information on top of the tissue. If you wanted to do a Visium experiment, there is no instrumentation from 10x that is required to do these experiments. I think about the Visium uh, expression, gene expression solution for fresh frozen as having two parts. The first is the tissue optimization part, which I'll talk to you about in the next few slides. And then we have the gene expression slide, which I just showed you the structure of. So tissue optimization is required for fresh frozen tissue just because Every tissue type is different. Some of the thicknesses can be different. And we need to, what we're doing with the tissue optimization kit is we're finding the ideal or optimal permeabilization time point for your tissue, because we need to, we need to be able to make sure that the tissue is permeabilized enough that we can access that mRNA molecule from the tissue that actually falls on the gene expression slide, and we're able to capture those. So the goal of the tissue optimization kit is to figure out what the permeabilization time should be. In terms of how it works, so you would take, you do your tissue prep. So this is going to be the same tissue type that you're going to be interested in doing the Visium experiment on. You'll section it, place it on the tissue slide. You'll notice the optimization slide has eight areas instead of four. You will do the staining and imaging. So if you're thinking about doing HME, so you do HME staining, take an image, and then we do permeabilization time point on this, um, a tissue optimization slide, and I'll show you how that is set up in the next slide. The key here is this 
slide has a non-barcoded capture. So this one doesn't have the lawn of oligos that I showed you that the gene expression slide has. But what we're doing here is once you do the permeabilization, when you do the cDNA synthesis, there is a fluorescent nucleotide that's included in the reagent. So you're generating a fluorescent footprint of where the cDNA is synthesized. So once you do the cDNA synthesis, you just take an image and this is where the tissue optimization workflow ends. So an example of what that might look like is here we're looking at mouse brain and we wanted to find what the optimal optimization time might be for this particular tissue at this thickness. So we start from zero minutes, we have positive control and you go up in um, time points. And you can, it can usually be every two minutes, every five minutes, depending on what the tissue type is. And the time point that's optimal for this tissue type turns out to be 12 minutes. And what we're really looking for is very robust cDNA footprint, which is the robust fluorescent signature. After a while, if you actually let it permeabilize for too long, the signal can start getting very diffuse. And that's not something what we want. So this is, again, something you have to do only once for your tissue type. Um, it's not something you have to repeat over and over, but we definitely recommend running this experiment um, at least once for a particular tissue type that you're interested in. We have a whole host of healthy as well as disease tissues that we've worked with for the fresh frozen solution. And all of this information is also available on our website. So you can easily go on and check and see if there's a particular tissue you're interested in. It also lists the tissue thickness as well as the time that we use for our experiment. So it can be a starting guideline. You definitely still have to do this at least once in your own hands to um, figure out the optimization, uh, permeabilization time point. But there's, there's a long list of tissues that we have experience working with already. So once you figure out what the permeabilization time point is, now you can go back and do your Visium gene expression experiment. So you will do your tissue prep, you'll section your tissue, place it on the slide, whatever staining you decide to do and have optimized on, you'll do the same thing. Now you know the permeabilization time point, so you permeabilize the tissue for the X amount of time. And this is where the barcoded capture occurs because the gene expression slides have that lawn of oligos. You generate cDNA on the gene expression slide and denature it. And from that point, you can take it out and work with the molecules in a microfuge tube. You amplify the cDNA, and then you finally construct an Illumina library out of it. This is what the final molecule will look like that is going to be sequenced. So it's a dual index library. The read one, we recommend sequencing at only 28 base pairs because the only two pieces of information you need from the forward read is the 16 base pair spatial barcode and the 12 base pair UMI. After that, you're going to sequence into a homopolymeric stretch, which doesn't provide any additional information as well as sometimes the polymerase can slip and it can affect the quality of the sequencing data that you get. And then from re 2 is where you get most of your transcriptomic information. Uh, we recommend sequencing at 90 base pairs for v 2 The read depth for these Visium experiments is we recommend 50,000 read pairs per spot covered with tissue. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when you look at the capture area and because you have to make sure you can see these judicials to align your image to the transcriptomic data, rarely will we have cases where 100% of the capture area is covered with tissue. So it might be that based on whatever you're working with, maybe you're working with a mouse brain that only covers 50% of the area. So in that case, you would just do a simple math of where we recommend 50,000 read pairs per spot times there's 5,000 total spots times multiplied by 50% because only 50% of the capture area is covered. So we do understand besides just the molecular biology aspect, the transcriptomics aspect, there's also the two other parts that I talked about, which are keys going to be the tissue preparation and imaging. So we do have resources available uh, for anyone to go and download from our website where you can start looking at what kind of tissue preparation uh, do we recommend, what kind of imaging capabilities you need to be able to do these um, Visium experiments. And without, again, spending too much time on here, if you do a Visium experiment, we already have software support that lets you 
analyze your data. So we call it our Space Ranger suite that lets you do the alignment, clustering analysis, et cetera. And then Loop Browser, if you've done um, any of single cell experiments with 10X, it's the same Loop Browser that you can use to uh, visualize your data as well. And it's very highly intuitive actually for using for Visium experiments. And then before I move on to FFP, I did also want to briefly mention the targeted panels that are available for the fresh frozen uh, solution. So oftentimes what can happen is, of course, we get the whole transcript home and that's, that's key to be able to look at genes that um, you might not otherwise investigate or have investigated in other ways. But sometimes there can also be a case where you will say, oh, I've done these experiments X number of times. I know the list of genes I want to go after. So in cases like that, we do have these uh, four pre-designed and pre-curated panels for pan cancer, immunology, gene signature, and neuroscience. So if you go to our website, if this is of interest to you, and look at the genes that are listed on these different panels, and turns out the panel is missing let's say 50 additional genes that you would like to have, you also have the option to add up to 200 genes to a pre-existing panel. So again, like I said, what the two key things that help that the targeted panels can help with is if you already know what genes you're looking for and you don't need the whole transcript home, you can go in in a targeted approach, as well as if you're also trying to cut down a little bit on the sequencing costs, the targeted approach can save you about 80% uh, of your sequencing, um, sequencing cost as well. The targeted solution does start off with the whole transcriptome library that you generate. The final library that you generate with the Visium solution is the starting point for the targeted panel. So you always also have the option to go back and look at the whole transcriptome if it turns out that that's what you wanted to do again. So with that, I'll now move into our Visium for FFP solution. As I mentioned, everything I presented so far is for Visium for Fresh Frozen, but a lot of uh, folks already have these um, FFP blocks that are stored and you would like to investigate those blocks. And as you all know, the issue with uh, FFP or fixation in general is the these molecules, these analytes can break down. So if you're trying to use a poly A based solution that captures the whole transcriptome, on FFP tissue, it's not going to work that well because if the poly A tail is broken, we're not really going to capture these, um, these transcripts. So we have redesigned, or it's a completely new biochemistry. It's not based off of poly A. That's uh, going to be part of our Visium for FFP solution. And at the initial launch, it's going to, we're going to support human and mouse. So there's about 18,000 genes in this um, targeted probe pair that we'll be using for human and about 20,000 genes in mouse. And just to show some very preliminary data of what that looks like. So here's an example in the mouse brain, we're looking at um, immunofluorescence for DAPI, GFAP, and nu N on the left. And then you can really nicely see different clustering data for from Visium for FFP that's overlaid on this particular immunofluorescence image. Similarly, here's an example for the human probe panel. So we have the human prostate cancer panel. On the left, again, is the DAPI. You can also see there's some calcification that is being shown as part of the immunofluorescence image. And when you overlay Visium for FFP data on there, you see all these different nice clusters, as well as you see the areas of where the calcification is. So, Overall, if we're thinking about the different parts for performing Visium for FFP, so the sample prep or tissue, uh, the tissue work, sectioning, and the imaging, and the library construction. So the overall idea still remains the same. But most of the difference now is going to be a little bit on the sample prep side. And then the biochemistry here is completely new. So I'll walk you through what the biochemistry for Visium for FFP is like. So for this particular solution, we have used RNA templated ligation, which gives us very sensitive and very specific RNA detection in FFP samples. We have these probe pairs that are designed to give the protein coding transcriptome. And 
In general, on average, we have one pair of these probe per gene. So you can see we have this left-hand side probe that has this uh, read two sequencing and um, sequence on here. And then we have this right-hand side probe that has a synthetic poly A tail. So after we put these probe pairs onto the tissue, the probes will go in and hybridize to their target sequence. And once they hybridize, they are then ligated together. So in terms of sensitivity, it's almost like the probe pairs first have to find the target sequence, right? And then they have to be successfully ligated for us to detect it. So the sensitivity is going to be pretty high. And then once the probe is a ligated, probes are hybridized and ligated to one another, then we go in and digest the target mRNA, so the original molecule from the tissue, which releases the ligated probes. And then what happens after that is this slide that's shown here, this is actually the same gene expression slide that we also use for fresh frozen. And recall that we have the synthetic poly A tail from the right hand side of the probe. So now we can use this uh, ligated probe pair and capture that on the gene expression slide, barcoded and prepared this into a sequencing library. Again, so this is the same gene expression slide. So instead of capturing an mRNA molecule and doing reverse transcription, taking that into a tube and performing second strand synthesis, et cetera, now we're capturing the ligated probe pairs onto the gene expression slide. So because of that, this insert size is actually going to be quite specific. It's about 50 base pairs, um, which also means that you don't have to do a lot of bead cleanups in between. Like if you were working with a fresh frozen um, Visium solution, because at that point you do have to go through a little lengthier library construction step. So in terms of sequencing, it's still going to be dual index. The only difference really is now the read to insert is going to be about 50 base pairs. But if you have Visium experiments for fresh frozen and FFPE, you can definitely combine them together and adjust the cycle to 90 cycles to cover for the Visium fresh frozen, but you can also run the FFPE solution on the, on the same, same sequencing run. In terms of the recommended sequencing depth, it's actually half of what we recommend for Visium for fresh frozen. So it's at 25,000 read pairs per spot. And part of this is also attributed to the fact that we have removed mitochondrial and ribosomal genes from the probe set. So um, th this can also reduce part of your sequencing burden as well. And what that means about if you wanted to do a Visium for FFP experiment, it just comes as this one kit that has the Vivian, FFP reagent kit, the transcriptome probe kit, and the gene expression slide kit. So these are all the things that you would need from 10x. Um, as of a few days ago, we are taking pre-order for the FFP solution if this is something you're interested in. So um, pre-order is starting now, but I, I believe the solution will be out sometime in June. So of course, we want to take a quick look at what the product performance is like as well, especially if you compare it to the fresh frozen product. So let me quickly walk you through some of the work we've done in-house for the product performance. So this is an example of product performance for if you took the Visium for fresh frozen solution as it is and followed it to a T with the 10X protocol, the sensitivity on FFP tissue is not going to be that great. There was another preprint protocol that came out um, sometime in the summer last year, I believe, where they optimized a little bit of the upstream workflow to get the sensitivity a little bit higher. So if you ran that optimized protocol, but with the fresh frozen solution, which is still we're priming off of the poly A tail, the sensitivity increases a little bit, but it's still, it's still not that great when you compare it to fresh frozen, right? So fresh frozen is always going to be the best because at that point you have the ability to capture these mRNA molecules before they're degraded, anything else happens to them. So when we compare the current Visium for FFP solution and the sensitivity to Sander Visium, it's actually pretty close and on par. So the sensitivity in general is really high compared to doing a whole transcriptome poly A-based approach. Here we're looking at serial FFP mouse brain sections. 
Um, and it's just to show that the data that we see is pretty comparable when you're looking at serial sections. So we're looking at the UMI counts for the two different sections and uh, they correlate really nicely. Here's an example of looking at a particular gene in a fresh frozen section of the mouse brain. So we're looking at the hippocampus, the HPCA gene is particularly um, known to be a marker of the hippocampal area, as well as if you look at the fresh uh, FFP, H FFP H &E staining of this particular region of the brain, as well as the um, HPCA gene, you can see it also very nicely and robustly um, visualized in the same area of the brain. Here's an example of some preliminary Visium FFP data and how uh, we compared fresh frozen to FFP. So this is a triple positive breast cancer. It's from about a two-year-old sample that was retrieved from a biobank. But what we were also able to do is get a fresh frozen section of the tissue from um, from the same patient to be able to do an FFP versus fresh frozen experiment. So when we do the fresh frozen workflow, the data for that is shown on the x-axis and compare that to the FFP tissue with the FFP workflow, the data looks pretty good. So sensitivity is pretty high. A lot of times we also look at number of genes detected as a way to figure out what the sensitivity of a particular assay is on a particular type of tissue. So in red here, we're looking at the gene detected on reads per spot for fixed versus blue is fresh frozen. And they seem to be pretty, pretty on par in terms of the sensitivity for genes detected. So going further in for this particular example and all the different things you can now find from this particular two-year-old FFP tissue is we're looking at just the h &E and what the pathologist annotated. So there's DCIS that's shown in yellow. We have fat, fibrous tissues, immune cells, et cetera. We can compare that patholo a path pathologist annotation to our gene expression clustering as well. So for example, whatever was um, annotated as DCIS is also shown by this um, cluster two, all the red spots, which aligns really nicely with the pathologist annotation. So the alignment is pretty tight here. But we can now also go in and look at particular genes because we captured the whole transcriptome. We can look at any genes we wanted to. So when we now look at signature markers of triple positive breast cancer, so down on the bottom, we have the immunohistochemistry of progesterone receptor, HER2 receptor, and estrogen receptor. And we can also now correlate that information to the gene expression for these particular uh, genes as well, which also correlates really nicely where, with where you see um, these proteins being expressed. But now you can go one step further in and just look at the graph-based clustering of all the different gene expression clusters you see in this particular tissue. And it's just, it's more than a few, right? So now we're showing about nine different clusters, which means there's some differences going on between cluster one versus cluster two, et cetera. So now you have the power to just go in and look at the different clusters and perform differential gene expression between these different clusters and start to figure out what might be, what might be going on there. So here's another example of uh, just focusing, here's this example, focuses on, um, let's focus on the regions of ductal carcinoma that's highlighted in yellow here. With the gene expression, we see that it's again very nicely aligns with the demarcations that is provided by the pathologist. But we can now go steps further as well, right? Because this is again, unbiased unbiased whole transcriptome is what we're capturing. If you're interested in, for example, saying, I want to look at how the immune cells are infiltrating this particular tissue. Now we can just go in and look at T cell markers, for example, CD4, and lights up wherever CD4 is being expressed. So you can say, oh, these are the areas where there, were, there was the presence of uh, T cells, as well as you can also look for macrophage markers such as ITGAM and figure out where in the tissue these macrophages were found as well. So this really 
this really provides a lot of information. It's a very rich data set and you can start going in and looking at different genes because now we've captured um, everything there is to capture with this just single assay. Just like with our Visium for fresh frozen solution, I showed you a list of um, tissue sections that we have tested and different types of tissues. So we have also tested the Visium for FFP on various uh, tissues as well. And the list of this tissue will be available once the product starts shipping on our website. So we've done a bunch of tissues for human. We've also tried a bunch of tissues for um, mouse as well. And then lastly, just a few workflow considerations and what the differences and similarities are between fresh frozen and FFP. So if we were to look at this in one particular screen as an overall um, workflow for FFP, you'll notice there are a few additional steps compared to fresh frozen. So for example, for FFP tissue section, you slice your tissue, put, put it on a Visium slide, for a fresh frozen, you have to have a snap frozen and OCT embedded tissue that you then section and put it on a slide. By the nature of the FFP tissue, it includes a deparaffinization step. Besides that, imaging for a fresh frozen and FFP is similar. Again, FFP requires a decrosslinking and overnight hybridization step, which the fresh frozen does not have. The biochemistry itself is different. So here's probe release and extension versus you're doing reverse transcription and cDNA synthesis. And then lastly, one part that's a little bit different is the library construction for FFP is much quicker and shorter and includes less speed, speed cleanup than it does for Visium for FFP. And having said that, so if you're working with a few different groups, so let's say you're, um, whoever is sectioning the tissue is a little bit further away or like on a different building than whoever is imaging is versus wherever the molecular biology is being done. So the nice thing about the FFP um, solution is we have placed quite a few stopping points where it's safe to store this particular at this particular step for let's say a few days, a few weeks. So it really gives the flexibility if you're especially if you're going in between a few different people to get this experiment done. And, and there's also some I call it involuntary stopping points as well, right? So because the probe pair uh, hybridization is an overnight step, so you also have an option to stop uh, stop there as well. And then lastly, I put this slide together as a way for a, just a quick review of if someone wanted to say, so what are the differences between Visium FFP versus Fresh Frozen? Um, it lists things like, you know, for example, staining is going to be the same between the two, HNE and immunofluorescence is supported. The capture method is different. You're using RNA poly A tail versus a synthetic poly A tail. In terms of tissue optimization, so the fresh frozen requires tissue optimization for permeabilization. The FFP solution does not have tissue uh, optimization. It's just one permeabilization time point for all of the tissues that will be working. And then one of the differences again is for Visium for fresh frozen, we recommend using uh, the RIN score and RIN score of greater than seven as a quality check to make sure you're going to get good data out of the tissue block. Uh, for FFP, we've moved to the recommendation of having DV200 more than 50%. And what this essentially means is 50% of the molecules that you are assessing for, for this particular assay is more than 200 base pairs in length. So we found that this um, gives a this is a better way to gauge into the uh, potential success of the Visium FFP experiment than trying to do a RIN score for Visium for FFP. So even if the Visium FFP does not have a tissue optimization step, we have something called a tissue adhesion slide, test slide. Um, and again, this is to make sure because there's a paraffin and there's uh, other materials involved in preserving this tissue. Sometimes the tissue can float off. So we're just trying to make sure that whatever tissue you're going to place on the uh, Visium gene expression slide is actually going to stick and not flow off. And then lastly, uh, if you know of 
our feature barcode technology or for maybe from single cell aspect, there's some academic methods such as SiteSeq. So it's a way of tagging an antibody with an oligonucleotide. And when you do reverse transcription, you actually also reverse transcribe the oligonucleotide that's uh, attached to the antibody. So you generate a library to, as a proxy of that oligo, um, as a proxy of that antibody, you're figuring out which proteins are expressed in the particular cell. So we're also bringing that to Visium as well. So for example, here you have immunofluorescence on Visium. This is mouse spleen CD29 in green, CD4 in red. And if we just go to the CD4 panel, this is the feature barcode output for this particular experiment. And you can see that it the CD4, um, wherever it's lighting up for feature barcode also nicely correlates with the immunofluorescence. And the example here is we ran about, I think 30 or so different antibodies on the same section. So really the key is, you know, instead of having spectral overlap or there being issues with not being able to multiplex multiple antibodies, um, the feature barcode way of doing these experiments takes out that fluorescence aspect. So you have, um, you have a lot of latitude in how many of these proteins you can you can multiplex and at the same time because you have the unbiased transcriptome you also can look into the mrna molecules as well and then lastly if visium for ffpe is of interest to you like i said we are taking pre-orders but as the product is getting ready to launch we have these three different webinars the first one will focus on uh, just introduction to Visium for FFPE. The second webinar is mostly focused on the workflow and how to get started. And the third webinar is focused on data analysis. So all of these will be coming out in the next um, few weeks to months. So if you're interested, I definitely recommend uh, logging into these webinars as well. So with that, I know there were a few questions looks like came up on the chat, so I'll take questions now, but just as a reminder, uh, I know I haven't been able to personally meet a lot of you, uh, but this is going to be your support team for 10X Genomics. So if you have any questions, if you need anything from us, you can reach out to any one of us, as well as if you have technical questions, you can also reach out to support at 10xgenomics.com. Thank you so much, Rosha. I didn't see any questions come up um, in the in the general chat. I don't know if anyone on the call has questions for Rosha and her team. Thanks, Christoph, for sharing those um, those resources. My pleasure, Rosha. Thank you. If you have any questions about Visium for Fresh Frozen, FFPE, any parts of sample prep imaging, any questions in general, or you want to talk about how this might be applicable to what you're doing, we're, we're here to chat about that. Hey, Rosha, I had a quick question about the FFPE stuff. Um, have you guys looked at how the product performance is affected by sample age? I believe that's something we are working on. So we're, as much as we can, we're trying to get access to these older samples and see how it performs. But the general guidance I've heard so far is as long as the DV200 is over 50%, the data should look pretty good. Once it falls below that, um, there's a little bit of trade-off. So I would definitely recommend just doing the DV200 to see what that looks like. And if it looks, it, you know, more than 50% is good, then you can anticipate that the experiment is going to be successful as well. And I was just to add on to kind of Rocha's comment, um, hi, this is Anne, um, but really what we've seen is that there's very poor correlation with the RIN score. So we will have RIN scores that are coming up in like the twos and threes. Um, but when you do the DV200, there's actually really sufficient material to do that. And so that's really where we've moved to that, that guidance recommendation. Yeah, I can I can send a PDF copy of the slides to Jen, uh, Jen, and you might be able to circulate that out to everybody. Yes, I was actually just trying to pop out to our website and see if that was in the bunch that you had forwarded. We do have three links up on the website um, for of materials that you sent the other day. I had a question about the. Um, 
slide, you mentioned um, determining the sequencing depth based on the percent of the area that the sample take it, took up. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible, depending on the sample size, to multiplex tissue at that step? Or have you guys explored that? And I'm, so, I, I can see based on the libraries multiplexing, but can't in the sample right. capture. Right. So I feel like it's one of those questions that are like hypothetically, yeah, it should work. Why not? But then once you start getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, what if the permeabilization times are different? What if the slide like tissue moves a little bit and you have multiple tissues? I think it can be done, but I, I believe it's not going to be as easy and might have a little bit more input. Yeah. And so I think Roche has really kind of hit on it is that it's um, a we first recommend practicing placing the tissue into that six and a half by six and a half millimeter square because that in and of itself is a little bit challenging. Um, I have seen customers who will put two pieces of tissue into that that square um, just kind of because they're working with really small pieces of tissue. Um, so it technically it's possible you'll generate the data. The, the other challenge that comes up is just bioinformatically, um, you know, keeping those as distinct because you've, spatially you've got them separated, but then just making sure that you've got a plan for how to bioinformatically approach the fact that those are two different pieces of tissues. Okay, great, thank you. Well, if there are no other questions or comments at this time, thank you, Rosha, so much for joining us. And thank you to your team for joining us and sharing this really cool technology with our, with our team here. Yeah, thank you for having us. We're really excited to present. And then, like I said, I'll send a PDF copy of the presentation. It does include all of our emails as well. So if anything else comes up after the meeting, definitely feel free to reach out to us as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Nice meeting you all. Take care. Bye. Thanks for having us.